chapter ten of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the tempest swept howling from the north across the island of pharos and the shallows of diabathra in the great harbour of alexandria the water usually so placid rose in high waves and the beacon on the lighthouse of sastratus sent the abundance of its flames with hostile impetuosity towards the city the fires in the pitch-pans and the torches on the shore sometimes seemed on the point of being extinguished at others burst with a doubly brilliant blaze through the smoke which obscured them the royal harbour a fine basin which surrounded in the form of a semicircle the southern part of the lochias and a portion of the northern shore of the bruchium was brightly illuminated every night but this evening there seemed to be an unusual movement among the lights on its western shore the private anchorage of the royal fleet was it the storm that stirred them no how could the wind have set one torch in the place of another and moved lights or lanterns in a direction opposite to its violent course only a few persons however perceived this for though joyous anticipation or anxious fears urged many thither who would venture upon the quay on such a tempestuous night besides no one would have found admittance to the royal port which was closed on all sides even the mole which towards the west served as the string to the bow of land surrounding it had but a single opening and as every one knew that was closed by a chain in the same way as the main entrance to the harbour between the pharos and alvius stejanus about two hours before midnight spite of the increasing fury of the tempest the singular movement of the lights diminished but rarely had the hearts of those for whom they burned throbbed so anxiously these were the dignitaries and court officials who stood nearest to cleopatra about twenty men and a single woman iris mardian and she had summoned them because the queen's letter permitted those to whom she had given authority to offer her a quiet reception after a long consultation they had not invited the commanders of the little roman garrison left behind it was doubtful whether those whom they expected would return that night and the roman soldiers who were loyal to antony had gone with him to the war the hall in the centre of the private roadstead of the royal harbour where they had assembled was furnished with regal magnificence for it was a favourite resort of the queen the spacious apartment lacked no requisite of comfort and most of those who were waiting used the well-cushioned couches while others harassed by mental anxiety paced to and fro as the room had remained unused for months bats had made nests there and now that it was lighted dazzled by the glare of the lamps and candles they darted to and fro above the heads of the assembly iris had ordered the commander of the malachis or youths a bodyguard composed of the sons of aristocratic macedonian families to expel the troublesome creatures and it diverted the thoughts of these devoted soldiers of the queen to strike at them with their swords others preferred to watch this futile battle rather than give themselves up to the anxiety which filled their minds the regent was gazing mutely at the ground iris pale and absent-minded was listening to zeno's statements and archibius had gone out of doors and unheeding the storm was looking across the tossing waves of the harbour for the expected ships in a wooden shed whose roof was supported by gaily painted pillars through which the wind whistled the servants from the porters to the litter-bearers had gathered in groups under the flickering light of the lanterns the greeks sat on wooden stools the egyptians upon mats on the floor the largest circle contained the parties who attended to the queen's luggage and the upper servants among whom were several maids they had been told that the queen was expected that night because it was possible that the strong north wind would bear her ship home with unexpected speed after the victory but they were better informed palaces have chinks in doors and curtains and are pervaded by a very peculiar echo which bears even a whisper distinctly from ear to ear the body-slave of the commander-in-chief seleucus was the principal spokesman his master had reached alexandria but a few hours ago from the frontier fortress of pelusium which he commanded a mysterious order from lucilius antony's most faithful friend brought from 
tinarum by a swift galley had summoned him hither the freedman beryllus a loquacious sicilian who as an actor had seen better days ere pirates robbed him of his liberty had heard many new things and his hearers listened eagerly for ships coming from the north which touched at pelusium had confirmed and completed the evil tidings that had penetrated the sebastium according to his story he was as well informed as if he had been an eye-witness of the naval battle for he had been present during his master's conversation with many ship captains and messengers from greece he even assumed the air of a loyal strictly silent servant who would only venture to confirm and deny what the alexandrians had already learned yet his knowledge consisted merely of a confused medley of false and true occurrences while the egyptian fleet had been defeated at actium and antony flying with cleopatra had gone first to tenarum at the end of the peloponnesian coast he asserted that the army and fleet had met on the peloponnesian coast and octavianus was pursuing antony who had turned towards athens while cleopatra was on her way to alexandria his trustworthy intelligence had been patched together from a few words caught from seleucus at table or while receiving and dismissing messengers in other matters his information was more accurate while for several days the harbour of alexandria had been closed vessels were permitted to enter pelusium and all captains of newly arrived ships and caravans were compelled to report to beryllus's master the commandant of the important frontier fortress he had quitted pelusium the night before the strong wind had driven the trireme before it so swiftly that it was difficult for even the sea-gulls to follow it was easy for the listeners to believe this for the storm outside howled louder and louder whistling through the open hall where the servants had gathered most of the lamps and torches had been blown out the pitch-pans only sent forth still blacker clouds of smoke lit by red and yellow flames and the closed lanterns alone continued to diffuse a flickering light so the wide space dim with smoke was illumined only by a dull varying glimmer one of the porters had furnished wine to shorten the hours of waiting but it could only be drunk in secret so there were no goblets the jars wandered from mouth to mouth and every sip was welcome for the wind blew keenly and besides the smoke irritated their throats the freedman beryllus was often interrupted by paroxysms of coughing especially from the women while relating the evil omens which were told to his master in pelusium each was well authenticated and surpassed its predecessor in significance here one of iris's maids interrupted him to tell the story of the swallows on the antonius cleopatra's admiral galley he could scarcely report from pelusium an omen of darker presage but beryllus gazed at her with a pitying smile which so roused the expectations of the others that the overseer of the litter and baggage porters who were talking loudly together hoarsely shouted silence soon no sound was heard in the open space save the shrill whistling of the wind a word of command to the harbour guards and the freedman's voice which he lowered to increase the charm of the mysterious events he was describing he began with the most fulsome praise of cleopatra and antony reminding his hearers that the imperator was a descendant of heracles the alexandrians especially were aware that their queen and antony claimed and desired to be called the new isis and the new dionysus but every one who beheld the roman must admit that in face and figure he resembled a god far more than a man the imperator had appeared as dionysus especially to the athenians in the proscenium of the theatre in that city was a huge bas-relief of the battle of the giants the famous work of an ancient sculptor he beryllus had seen it and from amid the numerous figures in this piece of sculpture the tempest had torn but a single one which dionysus the god as whose mortal image antony had once caroused in a vine-clad arbour in the presence of the athenians the storm to-night was at the utmost like the breath of a child compared with the hurricane which could wrest from the hard marble the form of dionysus but nature gathers all her forces when she desires to announce to short-sighted mortals the approach of events which are to shake the world 
the last words were quoted from his master who had studied in athens they had escaped from his burdened soul when he heard of another portent of which a ship from ostia had brought tidings the flourishing city pisara here however he was interrupted for several of those present had learned weeks before that this place had sunk in the sea but merely pitied the unfortunate inhabitants beryllus quietly permitted them to free themselves from the suspicion that people in alexandria had had tidings of so remarkable an event later than those in pelusium and at first answered their query what this had to do with the war merely by a shrug of the shoulders but when the overseer of the porters also put the question he went on the omen made a specially deep impression upon our minds for we know what pisara is or rather how it came into existence the hapless city which dark hades engulfed really belonged to antony for in the days of its prosperity he was its founder he measured the group with a defiant glance and there was no lack of evidences of horror nay one of the maid-servants shrieked aloud for the storm had just snatched a torch from the iron rings in the wall and hurled it on the floor close beside the listener suspense seemed to have reached its height yet it was evident that beryllus had not yet drawn his last arrow from the quiver the maid-servant whose scream had startled the others had regained her composure and seemed eager to hear some other new and terrible omen for with a beseeching glance she begged the freedman not to withhold what he knew he pointed to the drops of perspiration which spite of the wind sweeping through the hall covered her brow you must use your handkerchief merely listening to my tale will dampen your skin stone statues are made of harder material but a soul dwells within them too their natures may be harsher or more gentle they bring us woe or heal heavy sorrows according to their mood every one learns this who raises his hands to them in prayer one of these statues stands in alba it represents mark antony in whose honour it was erected by the city and it foresaw what menaced the man whose stone double it is i open your ears about four days ago a ship's captain came to my master and in my presence this man reported he grew as pale as ashes while he spoke what he himself had witnessed drops of perspiration had oozed from the statue of antony in alba horror seized all the citizens men and women came to wipe the brow and cheeks of the statue but the drops of perspiration did not cease to drip and this continued several days and nights the stone image had felt what was impending over the living mark antony it was a horrible spectacle the man said here the speaker paused and the group of listeners started for the clang of a gong was heard outside and the next instant all were on their feet hastening to their posts the officials in the magnificent hall had also risen here the silence had been interrupted only by low whispers the colour had faded from most of the grave anxious faces and their timid glances shunned one another archibius had first perceived by the flames of the pharos the red glimmer which announced the approach of the royal galley it had not been expected so early but was already passing the islands into the great harbour it was probably the antonius the ship on which the old swallows had pecked the young ones to death though the waves were running high even in the sheltered harbour they scarcely rocked the massive vessel an experienced pilot must have steered it past the shallows and cliffs on the eastern side of the roadstead for instead of passing around the island of anterodus as usual it kept between the island and the lochius steering straight towards the entrance into the little royal harbour the pitch-pans on both sides had been filled with fresh resin and tow to light the way the watchers on the shore could now see its outlines distinctly it was the antonius and yet it was not zeno the keeper of the seal who was standing beside iris wrapped his cloak closer around his shivering limbs pointed to it and whispered like a woman who leaves her parents house in the rich array of a bride and returns to it an impoverished widow iris drew herself up and with cutting harshness replied like the sun veiled by mists but which will soon shine forth again more radiantly than ever spoken from the depths of my soul said the old courtier eagerly so far as the queen is concerned of course i did not allude to her majesty but to the ship you were ill when it left the harbour garlanded with flowers and adorned with purple sails and now 
even this flickering light shows the wounds and rents i am the last person whom you need tell that our son cleopatra will soon regain its old radiance but at present it is very chilly and cold here by the water's edge in this stormy air and when i think of our first moment of meeting would it were over murmured iris wrapping herself closer in her cloak then she drew back shivering for the rattle of the heavy chain which was drawn aside from the opening of the harbour echoed with an uncanny sound through the silence of the night a mountain seemed to weigh upon the watchers breasts for the wooden monster which now entered the little harbour moved forward as slowly and silently as a spectral ship it seemed as if life were extinct on the huge galley usually swarming with a numerous crew as if a vessel were about to cast anchor whose sailors had fallen victims to the plague nothing was heard save an occasional word of command and the signal whistles of the flute-player who directed the rowers a few lanterns burned with a wavering light on the vast length of her decks the brilliant illumination which usually shone through the darkness would have attracted the attention of the alexandrians now it was close to the landing the group on shore watched every inch of its majestic progress with breathless suspense but when the first rope was flung to the slaves on shore several men in greek robes pressed forward hurriedly among the courtiers they had come with a message whose importance would permit no delay to the regent mardian who stood between zeno and iris gazing gloomily at the ground with a frowning brow he was pondering over the words in which to address the queen and within a few minutes the ship would have made her landing and cleopatra might cross the bridge to disturb him at that moment was an undertaking few who knew the irritable uncertain temper of the eunuch would care to risk but the tall macedonian who for a short time attracted the eyes of most of the spectators from the galley ventured to do so it was the captain of the night watch the aristocratic commander of the police force of the city only a word my lord he whispered to the regent though the time may be inopportune as inopportune as possible replied the eunuch with repellent harshness we will say as inopportune as the degree of haste necessary for its decision the king caesarion with antyllus and several companions attacked a woman blackened faces a fight caesarion and the woman's companion an aristocrat member of the council slightly wounded lictors interfered just in time the young gentlemen were arrested at first they refused to give their names caesarion slightly really only slightly wounded asked the eunuch with eager haste really and positively olympus was summoned at once a knock on the head the man who was attacked flung him on the pavement in the struggle dion the son of eumenes is the man interrupted iris whose quick ear had caught the officer's report the woman is barine the daughter of the artist leonax then you know already asked the macedonian in surprise so it seems answered mardian gazing into the girl's face with a significant glance then turning to her rather than to the macedonian he added i think we will have the young rascals set free and brought to lochias with as little publicity as possible to the palace asked the macedonian of course replied iris firmly each to his own apartments where they must remain until further orders everything else must be deferred until after the reception added the eunuch and the macedonian with a slight haughty nod drew back another misfortune sighed the eunuch a boyish prank iris answered quickly but even a still greater misfortune is less than nothing so long as we are not conscious of it this unpleasant occurrence must be concealed for the present from the queen up to this time it is a vexation nothing more and it can and must remain so for we have it in our power to uproot the poisonous tree whence it emanates you look as if no one could better perform the task the regent interrupted with a side glance at the galley so you shall have the commission it is the last one i shall give during the queen's absence in her name i shall not fail she answered firmly when iris again looked towards the landing-place she saw archibius standing alone with his eyes fixed upon the ground impulse prompted her to tell her uncle what had happened but at the first step she paused and her thin lips uttered a firm no 
her friend had become a stone in her path if necessary she would find means to thrust him also aside spite of his sister charmian and the old tie which united him to cleopatra he had grown weak charmian had always been so she would have had time enough now to consider what step to take first had not her heart ached so sorely after the huge galley lay moored several minutes elapsed ere two pastophori of the goddess isis who guarded the goblet of nectanibus taken from the temple treasures and borne along in a painted chest stepped upon the bridge followed by cleopatra's first chamberlain who in a low tone announced the approach of the queen and commanded the waiting groups to make way a double line of torch-bearers had been stationed from the landing to the gate leading into the bruchium and the other on the north which was the entrance to the palaces on the lochias since it was not known where cleopatra would desire to go the chamberlain however said that she would spend the night at lochias where the children lived and ordered all the flickering smoking torches save a few to be extinguished mardian the keeper of the seal archibius and iris were standing by the bridge a little in advance of the others when voices were heard on the ship and the queen appeared preceded by several lantern-bearers and followed by a numerous train of court officials pages maids and female slaves cleopatra's little hand rested on charmian's arm as with a haughty carriage of the head she moved towards the shore a thick veil covered her face and a large dark cloak concealed her figure how elastic her step was still how proud yet graceful was the gesture with which she waved a greeting to mardian and zeno extending her hand to raise iris who had sunk prostrate before her she kissed her on the forehead whispering the children all is well with them replied the girl then the returning sovereign greeted the others with a gracious gesture but vouchsafed a word to no one until the eunuch stepped before her to deliver his address of welcome she motioned him aside with a curt later and when zeno held open the door of the litter she said in a stifled tone i will walk after the rocking of the galley in this tempest i feel reluctant to enter the litter there are many things to be considered to-day an idea came to me on the way home summon the captain of the harbour and his chief counsellors the heads of the war office the superintendent of the fortifications on land and water especially the aristarch and gorgias i want to see them time presses they must be here in two hours no in an hour and a half i wish to examine all their plans and charts of the eastern frontier especially the river channels and canals in the delta then she turned to archibius who had approached the litter laid her hand upon his arm and though her veil prevented him from seeing her sparkling eyes he felt them shining deep into his heart as the voice whose melody had often enthralled his soul cried we will take it as a favourable omen that it is again you who lead me to this palace in a time of trouble his overflowing heart found expression in the warm reply whenever it may be for ever and ever this arm and this life are yours and the queen answered in a tone of earnest belief i know it then with her hand still resting on his arm she moved forward but when he began to ask whether she really had cause to speak of a time of trouble she cut him short with the entreaty not now let us say nothing it is worse than bad as evil as possible yet no few are permitted in an hour of trouble to lean on the arm of a faithful friend the words were accompanied with a slight pressure of her little hand and it seemed as if his old heart was growing young he dared not speak for her wish was law but while moving silently at her side first along the shore then through the gate and finally over the marble flagstones which led to the palace portal it seemed as if he beheld instead of the veiled head of the hapless queen the soft light brown locks which floated around the face of a happy child before his mental vision rose the little mistress of the garden of epicurus he saw the sparkle of her large blue eyes which never ceased to question yet appeared to contain the mystery of the world he fancied he heard once more the silvery cadence of her voice and the bewitching magic of her pure childlike laughter and it was hard to remember what she had become snatched away from the present yet conscious that fate had granted him a great boon in this sorrowful hour 
he moved on at her side and led her through the main entrance the spacious inner courtyard of the palace at the rear was the great door opening into the queen's apartments before which marty and iris and their companions had already stationed themselves at the left was a smaller one leading into the wing occupied by the children archibius was about to conduct cleopatra across the lighted courtyard but she motioned towards the children's rooms and he understood her at the threshold her hand fell from his arm and when he bowed as if to retire she said kindly there is charmian you both deserve to accompany me to the spot where childhood is dreaming and peace of mind and painlessness have their abode but respect for the queen has prevented the brother and sister from greeting each other after so long a separation do so now then follow me while speaking she hastened with the swift step of youth into the atrium and up the staircase which led to the sleeping rooms of the princes and princesses archibius and charmian obeyed her bidding the brother clasped his sister affectionately in his arms and in hurried tones with tears streaming from her eyes she informed him that to her all seemed lost antony had behaved in a manner for which no words of condemnation or regret were adequate probably he would follow cleopatra the fleet and perhaps the army also were destroyed her fate lay in the hands of octavianus then she preceded him towards the staircase where iris was standing with a tall syrian who bore a striking resemblance to philostratus barine's former husband it was his brother alexis the trusted favourite of mark antony his place should now have been with him and archibius asked his sister with a hasty look how this man chanced to be in the queen's train his skill in reading the stars was the reply his flattering tongue he is a parasite of the worst kind but he tells her many things he diverts her and she tolerates him near her person as soon as iris saw the direction in which cleopatra had turned she had hastened after her to accompany her to the children the syrian alexis had stopped her to express his joy in meeting her again even before the outbreak of the war he had devoted himself zealously to her and he now plainly showed that during the long period of separation his feelings had by no means cooled like his brother he had a head too small for his body but his well-formed features were animated by a pair of eyes sparkling with a keen covetous expression iris too seemed glad to welcome the favourite but ere the brother and sister reached the staircase she left them to embrace charmian her aunt and companion with the affection of a daughter they found the queen in the ante-room of the children's apartments euphronion their tutor had awaited her there and hurriedly gave in the most rapturous terms his report of them and the wonderful gifts which became more and more apparent in each now as a heritage from their mother now from their father cleopatra had interrupted the torrent of his enthusiastic speech with many a question meanwhile endeavouring to loose the veil wound about her head but the little hands unaccustomed to the task failed iris noticed it from the stairs and hastening up the last step skilfully released her from the long web of lace the queen acknowledged the service by a gracious nod but when the chief eunuch opened the door leading into the children's rooms she called joyously to the brother and sister come the tutor who was obliged to leave the charge of his pupils sleeping apartments to the eunuchs and nurses drew back but iris felt it a bitter affront to be excluded from this visit her cheeks flushed and paled her thin lips were more firmly compressed and she gazed intently at the basket of fruit in the mosaic floor at her feet as if she were counting the cherries that filled it but she suddenly pushed the little curls back from her forehead darted swiftly down the stairs and called to alexis just as he was about to leave the atrium the syrian hastened towards her extolling the good fortune that made his son rise for him a second time that night but she cut him short with the word cease this foolish love-making it would be far better for us both to become allies in serious bitter earnest i am ready so am i cried the syrian rapturously pressing his hand upon his heart meanwhile cleopatra had entered the chamber where the children lay sleeping deep silence pervaded the lofty hall hung with bright-hued carpets and softly lighted by three lamps with rose-coloured globes an arch supported by pillars of libyan marble divided the wide space in the first near a window closely muffled with drapery stood two ivory beds surmounted with crowns of gold and silver set with pearls and turquoises around the edge carved by the hands of a great artist ran a line of happy children dancing to the songs of birds and blossoming bushes 
the couches were separated by a heavy curtain which the eunuchs had raised at the approach of the queen cleopatra could now see them all at a single glance and the picture was indeed one of exquisite charm for on these beautiful couches slept the twins the ten-year-old children of cleopatra and antony antonius helios and cleopatra Selene. the girl was pink and white fair and wonderfully lovely the boy no less beautiful but with ebon black hair like his father both curly heads were turned towards the side and rested on a dimpled hand pressed upon the silken pillow upon a third bed beyond the arch was alexander the youngest prince a lovely boy of six the queen's darling after gazing a long while at the twins and pressing a light kiss upon cheeks flushed with slumber she turned to the youngest child and sank beside his couch as if forced to bend the knee before some apparition which heaven had vouchsafed to her tears streamed from her eyes as drawing the child carefully towards her she kissed his mouth eyes and cheeks and then laid him gently back upon the pillows the boy however did not instantly relapse into slumber but threw his little plump arms around his mother's neck murmuring incomprehensible words she joyously submitted to his caresses till sleep again overpowered him and his little hands fell back upon the bed she lingered a short time longer with her brow resting on the ivory of the couch praying for this child and his brother and sister when she rose again her cheeks were wet with tears and she pressed her hand upon her breast then beckoning to charmian and archibius she motioned towards alexander and the twins saying as she saw tears glittering in the eyes of both i know you have lost this happiness for my sake for each one of these children a great empire would not be too high a price for them all what does earth contain that i would not bestow yet what can i still call my own her smiling face clouded as she asked the question the vision of the lost battle again rose before her mind her own power was lost forfeited and with it the independence of the native land which she loved rome was already stretching out her hand to add it to the others as a new province but this should not be her twin children yonder sleeping beneath crowns must wear them and the boy slumbering on the pillows how many kingdoms antony had bestowed what remained for her to give again she bent to the child a beautiful dream must have hovered over him for he was smiling in his sleep a flood of maternal love welled up in her agitated heart and as she saw the companions of her childhood also gazing tenderly at the little sleeper she remembered the days of her own youth and the quiet happiness which she had enjoyed in her garden of epicurus power and splendour had begun for her beyond its confines but the greater the heights of worldly grandeur she attained the more distant the more irrecoverable became the consciousness of the happiness which she had once gratefully enjoyed and for which she had never ceased to long and as she now gazed once more at the peaceful smiling face whence all pain and anxiety seemed worlds away and all the love which her heart contained appeared to be pouring towards him the question arose in her mind whether this boy for whom she possessed no crown might not be the only happy mortal of them all happy in the sense of the master deeply moved by this thought she turned to archibius and charmian exclaiming in a subdued tone in order not to rouse the sleeper whatever destiny may await us i commend this child to your special love and care if fate denies him the lustre of the crown and the elation of power teach him to enjoy that other happiness which how long ago it is your father unfolded to his mother archibius kissed her robe and charmian in her hands but cleopatra drawing a long breath said the mother has already taken too much time from the queen i have ordered the news of my arrival to be kept from caesarion this was well the most important matters will be settled before our meeting everything relating to me and to the state must be decided within an hour but first i am something more than mother and queen the woman also asserts her claim i will find time for you my friend to-morrow to my chamber first charmian but you need rest still more than i go with your brother send iris to me she will be glad to use her skilful fingers again in her mistress's service End of chapter ten chapter eleven of cleopatra by georg ebers translated by mary j safford this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven 
the queen had left her bath iris had arranged the still abundant waves of her hair now dark brown in hue and robed her magnificently to receive the dignitaries whom spite of the late hour of the night she expected how wonderfully she had retained her beauty it seemed as if time had not ventured to touch this masterpiece of feminine loveliness yet the greek's keen eye detected here and there some token of the vanishing spell of youth she loved her mistress yet her inmost soul rejoiced whenever she detected in her the same changes which began to appear in herself the woman of seven-and-twenty so many years her sovereign's junior she would gladly have given cleopatra everything at her command yet she felt as if she must praise nature for an act of justice when she perceived that even her royal favourite was not wholly relieved from the law which applied to all cease your flattery said cleopatra smiling mournfully they say that the works of the pharaohs here on the nile flout time the inexorable destroyer is less willing to permit this from the queen of egypt these are grey hairs and they came from this head however eagerly you may deny it whose save my own are these lines around the corners of the eyes and on the brow what say you to the tooth which my lips do not hide so kindly as you assert it was injured the night before the luckless battle my dear faithful skilful olympus the prince of leeches is the only one who can conceal such things but it would not do to take the old man to the war and glaucus is far less adroit how i missed olympus during those fatal hours i seemed a monster even to myself and he antony's eye is only too keen for such matters what is the love of men a blackened tooth may prove its destruction an aspect obnoxious to the gaze will pour water on the fiercest fire what hours i experienced iris many a glance from him seemed an insult and besides my heart was filled with torturing anxiety something had evidently come between us i felt it the trouble began soon after he left alexandria it gnawed my soul like a worm and now that i am here again i must see clearly he will follow me in a few days i know Pinarius scarpus with his untouched legions is in peritonium whither he went at tenarum he resolved to retire from the world which he on whom it had bestowed so much that is great hates because he has given it cause for many a shake of the head but the old spirit woke again and if fortune usually so faithful still aids him a large force will soon join the new african army the asiatic princes but the ruler of the state must be silent i entered this room to give the woman her just rights and the woman shall have them he will soon be here he cannot live without me it is not alone the beaker of nectanibus which draws him after me when the greatest of the great julius caesar sued for your love in alexandria and antony on the sidness you did not possess the goblet observed iris it is two years since anubis permitted you to borrow the masterpiece from the temple treasures and within a few days you will be obliged to restore it that a mysterious spell emanates from the cup is certain but one still more powerful dwells in the magic of your own nature would that it might assert itself to-day cried the queen at any rate the power of the beaker impelled antony to do many things i am not vain enough to believe that it was love that it was solely the spell of my own personality which drew him to me in that disastrous hour that battle that incomprehensible disgraceful battle you were ill and could not see our fleet when it set sail but even experienced spectators said that handsomer larger vessels were never beheld i was right in insisting that the decision of the conflict should be left to them i was entitled to call them mine had we conquered what a proud delight it would have been to say the weapons which you gave to the man you loved gained him the sovereignty of the world besides the stars had assured me that good fortune would attend us on the sea they had given the same message to anubis here and to alexis upon antony's galley i also trusted the spell of the goblet which had already compelled antony to do many things he opposed 
so i succeeded in having the decision of the conflict left to the fleet but the prediction was false 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 how utterly was to be proved only too soon if i had only been told in time what i learned later after the defeat people were more loquacious that one remark of a veteran commander of the foot soldiers would probably have sufficed to open my eyes he had asked mark antony why he fixed his hopes on miserable wood exclaiming let the phoenicians and egyptians war on the water but leave us the land where we are accustomed with our feet firmly set upon the earth to fight conquer or die this alone i am sure would have changed my resolve in a happy hour but it was kept from me the conflict began our troops had lost patience the left wing of the fleet advanced at first i watched the battle eagerly with a throbbing heart how proudly the huge galleys moved forward everything was going admirably antony had made an address assuring the warriors that even without soldiers our ships would destroy the foe by their mere height and size what orator can so carry his hearers with him i too was still fearless who cherishes anxiety when confidently expecting victory when he went on board his own ship after bidding me farewell far less cordially than usual i became more troubled i thought it was evident that his love was waning what had i become since we left alexandria and olympus no longer attended me matters could not continue in this way i would leave the direction of the war to him and vanish from his eyes after he had looked into the beaker of nectanabus he yielded to my will but often with indignation the unconcealed ineffaceable lines and the years the cruel years what thoughts are these cried iris let me take oath my sovereign mistress that as you stand before me thanks to this toilet-table and the new compounds of olympus and these boxes at that time i tell you i was fairly startled at the sight of my own face trouble does not enhance beauty and what condemnation the romans had heaped on the woman who meddled with war the craft of man i had answers for them but i would not endure it longer i had previously determined to hold aloof from the battle on land but even at the commencement of the conflict spite of its favourable promise i longed to leave antony and return to the children they do not heed the colour of their mother's hair nor her wrinkles and he when he had looked for and called me in vain would feel for the first time what he possessed in me would miss me and with the longing the old love would awaken with fresh ardour as soon as the fleet had gained the victory i would have the prow of my galley turned southward and without a farewell exclaiming only we will meet in alexandria set sail for egypt i summoned alexis who had remained with me and ordered him to give me a signal as soon as the battle was decided in our favour i remained on deck then i saw the ships of the foe describing a wide circle the new ark told me that agrippa was trying to surround us this roused a feeling of discomfort i began to repent having meddled with men's work antony looked across at me from his galley i waved my hand to point out the peril but instead of eagerly and lovingly answering the greeting as of yore he turned his back and in a short time after the wildest uproar arose around me our ship became entangled with another planks and poles shattered with a loud crash shouts the cries and moans of the combatants and the wounded mingled with the thunder of the stones hurled by the catapults and the sharp notes of the signals which sounded like calls for help two soldiers stricken by arrows fell beside me it was horrible yet my courage remained steadfast even when a squadron it was commanded by arruntius pressed upon the fleet i saw another line of galleys steering directly towards us and a roman vessel assailed by one of mine i had named her the selene turned on her side and sink this pleased me and seemed like the first presage of victory i again ordered alexis to have the ship's prow turned as soon as the result of the battle was decided ere i had ceased speaking jason the steward you know him appeared with refreshments i took the beaker but ere i could raise it to my lips he fell to the deck with a cloven skull mingling his blood with the spilled juice of the grape my blood seemed fairly to freeze in my veins and alexis trembling and deadly pale asked do you command us to quit the battle 
every fibre of my being urged me to give the order but i controlled myself and asked the new ark who was standing on the bridge before me are we gaining the advantage the reply was a positive yes i thought the fitting time had come and called to him to steer the galley southward but the man did not seem to understand meanwhile the noise of the conflict had grown louder and louder so in spite of charmian who besought me not to interfere in the battle i sent alexis to the commander on the bridge and while he talked with the grey-bearded seaman who wrathfully answered i know not what i glanced at the nearest ship i no longer knew whether it was friend or foe and as i saw the rows of restless oars moving in countless numbers to and fro it seemed as if every ship had become a huge spider and the long wooden handles of the oars were its legs and feet each of these monsters appeared to be seeking to snare me in a horrible net and when the new ark came to beseech me to wait i imperiously commanded him to obey my orders the luckless man bowed and performed his queen's behest the giant was turned and forced a passage through the maze i breathed more freely what had threatened me like the legs of huge spiders became oars once more alexis led me under a roof where no missiles could reach me my desire was fulfilled i had escaped antony's eyes and we were going towards alexandria and my children when i at last looked around i saw that my other ships were following i had not given this order and was terribly startled when i sought alexis he had vanished the centurion whom i sent to order the new ark to give the signal to the other ships to return to the battle reported that the captain's dead body has just been borne away but that the command should be given how this was done i do not know but it produced no effect and no one noticed the anxious waving of my handkerchief we had left antony's galley he was standing on the bridge far behind i had waved my hand as we passed close by and he hurried down to bend far over the bulwark and shout to me i can still see his hands raised to his bearded lips i did not understand what he said and only pointed southward and in spirit wished him victory and that this separation might tend to the welfare of our love but he shook his head pressed his hand despairingly to his brow and waved his arms as though to give me a sign but the antonia swept far ahead of his ship and steered straight towards the south i breathed more freely in the pleasant consciousness of escaping a twofold danger had i remained long before antony's eyes looking as i did then it might wretched blunder of a wretched woman i say now but at that time i could not suspect what a terrible doom i had brought down in that hour upon ourselves my children perhaps the whole world so i remained under the thrall of these petty fears and thoughts until wounded men were carried past me the sight distressed me you know how sensitive i am and with what difficulty i endure and witness suffering charmian led me to the cabin there i first realized what i had done i had hoped to aid in crushing the hated foe and now perhaps it was i who had built for him the bridge to victory to sovereignty to our destruction pursued by such thoughts as if by the furies i paced restlessly to and fro suddenly i heard a loud noise on deck a crashing blow seemed to shake the huge ship we were pursued a roman galley had boarded mine this was my thought as i grasped the dagger antony had given me but charmian came back with tidings which seemed scarcely less terrible than the baseless fear i had angrily commanded her to leave me because she had urged me to revoke the command to turn back now deadly pale she announced that mark antony had left his galley followed me in a little five-oared boat and come on board our ship my blood froze in my veins he had come i imagined to force me to return to the battle and drawing a long breath my defiant pride urged me to show him that i was the queen and would obey only my own will while my heart impelled me to sink at his feet and beseech him without heeding me to issue any order which promised to secure a victory but he did not come antony had been unable to continue the conflict when parted from me now he sat in front of the cabin with his head resting on his hands staring at the planks of the deck like one distraught he he antony the bravest horseman the terror of the foe let his arms fall like a shepherd boy whose sheep are stolen by the wolves mark antony the hero who had braved a thousand dangers had flung down his sword why why 
because a woman had yielded to idle fears obeyed the yearning of a mother's heart and fled of all human weaknesses not one had been more alien than cowardice to the man whose recklessness had led him to many an unprecedented venture and now no a thousand times no fire and water would unite sooner than mark antony and cowardice he had been under the coercive power of a demon a mysterious spell had forced him the mightiest power love interrupted iris with enthusiastic warmth a love as great and overmastering as ever subjugated the soul of man ay love repeated cleopatra in a hollow tone then her lips curled with a faint tinge of derision and her voice expressed the very bitterness of doubt as she continued had it been merely the love which makes two mortals one transfers the heart of one to the other it might perchance have borne my timorous soul into the hero's breast but no violent tempests had raged before the battle it had not been possible always to appear before him in the guise in which we would fain be seen by those whom we love even now when your skilful hands have served me there is the mirror the image it reflects seems to me like a carefully preserved wreck oh my royal mistress cried iris raising her hands beseechingly must i again declare that neither the gray hairs which are again brown nor the few lines which olympus will soon render invisible nor whatever else perhaps disturbs you in the image you behold reflected impairs your beauty unclouded and secure of victory the spell of your godlike nature cease cease interrupted cleopatra i know what i know no mortal can escape the great eternal laws of nature as surely as birth commences life everything that exists moves onward to destruction and decay yet the gods iris persisted give to their works different degrees of existence the water-lily blooms up but a single day yet how full of vigour is the sycamore in the garden of the paneum which has flourished a thousand years not a petal in the blossoms of your youth has faded and is it conceivable that there is even the slightest diminution in the love of him who cast away all that man holds dearest because he could not endure to part even for days or weeks from the woman whom he worshipped would that he had done so cried cleopatra mournfully but are you so sure that it was love which made him follow me i am of a different opinion true love does not paralyze but doubles the high qualities of man i learned this when caesar was prisoned by a greatly superior force within this very palace his ships burned his supply of water cut off in him also in antony i was permitted to witness this magnificent spectacle twenty what do i say a hundred times so long as he loved me with all the ardour of his fiery soul but what happened at actium that shameful flight of the cooing dove after his mate at which generations yet unborn will point in mockery he who does not see more deeply will attribute to the foolish madness of love this wretched forgetfulness of duty honour fame the present and the future but i iris and this is the thought which whitens one hair after another which will speedily destroy the remnant of your mistress's former beauty by the exhaustion of sleepless nights i know better it was not love which drew antony after me not love that trampled in the dust the radiant image of reckless courage not love that constrained the demigod to follow the pitiful track of a fugitive woman here her voice fell and seizing the girl's wrist with a painful pressure she drew her closer to her side and whispered the goblet of nectanibus is connected with it i tremble the powers that emanate from the glittering wonder are as terrible as they are unnatural the magic spell exerted by the beaker has transformed the heroic son of heracles the more than mortal into the whimpering coward the crushed broken nonentity i found upon the galley's deck you are silent your nimble tongue finds no reply how could you have forgotten that you aided me to win the wager which forced antony to gaze into the beaker before i filled it for him how grateful i was to anubis when he finally consented to trust to my care this marvel of the temple treasures when the first trial succeeded and antony at my bidding placed the magnificent wreath which he wore upon the bald brow of that crabbed old follower of aristoteles diomedes whom he detested in his inmost soul 
it was scarcely a year ago and you know how rarely at first i used the power of the terrible vessel the man whom i loved obeyed my slightest glance without its aid but later before the battle i felt how gladly he would have sent me who might ruin all back to egypt besides i felt i have already said so that something had come between us yet often as he was on the point of sacrificing me to the importunate romans i need only bid him gaze into the beaker and exclaim you will not send me hence we belong together whither one goes the other will follow and he besought me not to leave him the very morning before the battle i gave him the drinking cup urging him whatever might happen never never to leave me and he obeyed this time also though the person to whom a magic spell bound him was a fleeing woman it is terrible and yet have i a right to execrate the thrall of the beaker scarcely for without the magian's glittering vessel a secret voice in my soul has whispered the warning a thousand times during the sleepless nights he would have taken another on the galley and i believe i know this other i mean the woman whose singing enthralled my heart too at the adonis festival just before our departure i noticed the look with which his eyes sought hers now i know that it was not merely my old deceitful foe jealousy which warned me against her alexis the most faithful of his friends also confirmed what i merely feared ah and he told me other things which the stars had revealed to him besides he knows the siren for she was the wife of his own brother to protect his honour he cast off the coquettish circe barine fell in resolute tones from the lips of iris so you know her asked cleopatra eagerly the girl raised her clasped hands beseechingly to the queen exclaiming i know this woman only too well and how my heart rages against her o oh, my mistress that i too should aid in darkening this hour yet it must be said that antony visited the singer and even took his son there more than once is known throughout the city yet that is not the worst a barine entering into rivalry with you it would be too ridiculous but what bounds can be set to the insatiate greed of these women no rank no age is sacred it was dull in the absence of the court and the army there were no men who seemed worth the trouble of catching so she cast her net for boys and the one most closely snared was the king caesarion caesarion exclaimed cleopatra her pale cheeks flushing and his tutor rhodon my strict commands antyllus secretly presented him to her replied iris but i kept my eyes open the boy clung to the singer with insensate passion the only expedient was to remove her from the city archibius aided me then i shall be spared sending her away nay that must still be done for on the journey to the country caesarion with several comrades attacked her and the reckless deed was successful no my royal mistress i wish it had been a lovesick fool who accompanied her drew his sword in her defence raised his hand against the son of caesar and wounded him calm yourself i beseech you i conjure you the wound is slight the boy's mad passion makes me far more anxious the queen's pouting scarlet lips closed so firmly that her mouth lost the winning charm which was peculiar to it and she answered in a firm resolute tone it is the mother's place to protect the son against the temptress alexis is right her star stands in the path of mine a woman like this casts a deep shadow on her queen's course i will defend myself it is she who has placed herself between us she has won antony but no why should i blind myself time and the charms he steals from women are far more powerful than twenty such little temptresses then there are the circumstances which prevented my concealing the defects that wounded the eyes of this most spoiled of all spoiled mortals all these things aided the singer i feel it in her pursuit of men she had at her command all the means which aid us women to conceal what is unlovely and enhance what is beautiful in a lover's eyes while i was at a disadvantage lacking your aid in the long-tested skill of olympus the divinity on the ship amid the raging of the storm was forced more than once to appear before the worshipper ungarlanded without ornament for the head or incense but though she used all the combined arts of aphrodite and isis she could not vie with you my royal mistress cried iris how little is required to delude the senses of one scarcely more than a child poor boy sighed the queen gently had he not been wounded and were it not so hard to resign what we love i should rejoice that he too understands how to plan and act perhaps o oh, iris would that it might be so 
now that the gate is burst open the brain and energy of the great caesar will enter his living image as the egyptians call horus the avenger of his father perhaps he may become his mother's defender and avenger if caesar's spirit wakes within him he will wrest from the dissembler octavianus the heritage of which the nephew robbed the son you swear that the wound is but a slight one the physicians have said so well then we will hope so let him enter the conflict of life we will afford him ample opportunity to test his powers no foolish passion shall prevent the convalescent youth from following his father upward along the pathway of fame but send for the woman who ensnared him the audacious charmer whose aspirations mount to those i hold dearest we will see how she appears beside me these are grievous times said iris who saw in amazement the queen's eyes sparkle with the confident light of victory grant your foot its right let it crush her monsters enough on whom you cannot set your foot throng your path hence to hades in these days of conflict with all who can be quickly removed murder asked cleopatra her noble brow contracting in a frown if it must be i replied iris sharply if possible banishment to an island an oasis if necessity requires to the mines with the siren if necessity requires repeated the queen i think that means if it proves that she has deserved the harshest punishment she has brought it upon herself by every hour of my sovereign's life clouded through her wiles in the mines the desire to set snares for husbands and sons soon vanishes and people languish in the most terrible torture till death ends their suffering added cleopatra in a tone of grave reproof no girl this victory is too easy i will not send even my foe to death without a hearing especially at this time which teaches me what it is to await the verdict of one who is more powerful this woman who as it were summons me to battle shall have her wish i am curious to see the singer again and to learn the means by which she has succeeded in chaining to her triumphal car so many captives from boys up to the most exacting men what do you intend my royal mistress cried iris in horror i intend said cleopatra imperiously to see the daughter of leonax the granddaughter of didymus two men whom i hold in high esteem ere i decide her destiny i wish to behold test and judge my rival heart and mind ere i condemn her i will engage in the conflict to which she challenged the loving wife and mother but this is my right i will compel her to show herself to me as antony so often saw me during the past few weeks unaided and unimproved by the arts which we both have at command then without paying any further heed to her attendant she went to a window and after a swift glance at the sky added quietly the first hour after midnight is drawing to a close the council will begin immediately the matter to be under discussion is a venture which might save much from the wreck the council will last two hours perchance only one the singer can wait where does she live in the house which belonged to her father the artist leonax in the garden of the paneum replied iris hoarsely but o oh, my queen if ever my opinion had the slightest weight with you i desire no counsel now but demand the fulfilment of my orders cried cleopatra resolutely as soon as those whom i expect are here the queen was interrupted by a chamberlain who announced the arrival of the men whom she had summoned and cleopatra bade him tell them that she was on her way to the council chamber then she turned again to iris and in rapid words commanded her to go at once in a closed carriage accompanied by a reliable person to barine's house she must be brought to the palace without the least delay iris would understand even if it should be necessary to rouse her from her sleep i wish to see her as if a storm had forced her suddenly upon the deck of a ship she said in conclusion then snatching a small tablet from the dressing-table she scrawled upon the wax with a rapid hand cleopatra the queen desires to see barine the daughter of leonax without delay she must obey any command of iris cleopatra's messenger and her companion then closing the diptychon she handed it to her attendant asking whom will you take she answered without hesitation alexis very well answered cleopatra do not allow her a moment for preparations whatever they may be but do not forget i command you that she is a woman with these words she turned to follow the chamberlain but iris hurried after her to adjust the diadem upon her head and arrange some of the folds of her robe cleopatra submitted saying kindly something else i see is weighing on your heart oh my mistress cried the girl after these tempests of the soul these 
harassing months you are turning night into day and assuming fresh labours and anxieties if the leech olympus it must be interrupted cleopatra kindly the last two weeks seemed like a single long and gloomy night during which i sometimes left my couch for a few hours one who seeks to drag what is dearest from the river does not consider whether the cold bath is agreeable if we succumb it does not matter whether we are well or ill if on the contrary we succeed in gathering another army and saving egypt let it cost health and life the minutes i intend to grant to the woman will be thrown into the bargain whatever may come i shall be ready to meet my fate i am at one of life's great turning points and such a time we fulfil our obligations and demands both great and small a few minutes later cleopatra entered the throne-room and saluted the men whom she had roused from their slumber in order to lay before them a bold plan which in the lowest depths of misfortune her yearning to offer fresh resistance to the victorious foe had caused her vigorous restless mind to evoke when many years before the boy with whom according to her father's will she shared the throne and his guardian pothinus had compelled her to fly from alexandria she had found in the eastern frontier of the delta on the isthmus which united egypt to asia the remains of the canal which the energetic pharaohs of former times had constructed to connect the mediterranean with the red sea even at that period she had deemed this ruinous work worthy of notice had questioned the enites who dwelt there about the remains and even visited some of them herself during the leisure hours of waiting from this survey it had seemed possible by a great expenditure of labour to again render navigable the canal which the pharaohs had used to reach both seas in the same galleys and by which less than five hundred years before darius the founder of the persian empire had brought his fleet to his support with the tireless desire for knowledge characteristic of her cleopatra had sought information concerning all these matters and in quiet hours had more than once pondered over plans for again uniting the grecian and arabian seas clearly plainly fully with more thorough knowledge of many details than even the superintendent of the water-works she explained her design to the assembled professionals if it proved practicable the rescued ships of the fleet with others lying in the roadstead of alexandria could be conveyed across the isthmus into the red sea and thus saved to egypt and withdrawn from the foe supported by this force many things might be attempted resistance might be considerably prolonged and the time thus gained used in gathering fresh aid and allies if the opportunity to make an attack arrived a powerful fleet would be at her disposal for which smaller ships also should now be built at clisma on the basis of the experience gained at actium the men who had been robbed of their night's rest listened in amazement to the melodious words of this woman who in the deepest disaster had devised a plan of escape so daring in its grandeur and understood how to explain it better than any one of their number could have done they followed every sentence with the keenest attention and cleopatra's language grew more impassioned gained greater power and depth the more plainly she perceived the unfeigned enthusiastic admiration paid her by her listeners even the oldest and most experienced men did not consider the surprising proposal utterly impossible and impracticable some among them gorgias who during the restoration of the serapium had helped his father on the eastern frontier of the delta and thus became familiar with the neighbourhood of Hieroonopolis feared the difficulties which an elevation of the earth in the centre of the isthmus would place in the way of the enterprise yet why should an undertaking which was successful in the days of sesostris appear unattainable the shortness of the time at their disposal was a still greater source of anxiety and to this was added the information that one hundred and twenty thousand workmen had perished during the restoration of the canal which pharaoh necho nearly completed the waterway was not finished at that period because an oracle had asserted that it would benefit only the foreigners the phoenicians all these points were duly considered but could not shake the opinion that under specially favourable conditions queen's plan would be practicable though to execute it obstacles mountain high were to be conquered all the labourers in the fields who had not been pressed into the army must be summoned to the work not an hour's delay was permitted where there was no water to bear the ships an attempt must be made to convey them across the land 
there was no lack of means the mechanics who had understood how to move the obelisks and colossi from the cataract to alexandria could here again find opportunity to test their brains and former skill never had cleopatra's kindling spirit roused more eager nay more passionate sympathy in any counsellors gathered around her than during this nocturnal meeting and when at last she paused the loud acclamations of excited men greeted her the queen's return and the tidings of the lost battle which she had communicated were to be kept secret gorgias had been appointed one of the directors of the enterprise and the intellect voice and winning charm of cleopatra had so enraptured him that he already fancied he saw the commencement of a new love which would be fatal to his regard for helena it was foolish to raise his wishes so high but he told himself that he had never beheld a woman more to be desired yet he cherished a very warm memory of the philosopher's granddaughter and lamented that he would scarcely find it possible to bid her farewell zeno the keeper of the seal dion's uncle had questioned him about his nephew in a very mysterious manner as soon as he entered the council chamber and received the reply that the wound in the shoulder which caesarion had dealt with a short roman sword though severe was so the physicians assured them not fatal this seemed to satisfy zeno and ere gorgias could urge him to extend a protecting hand over his nephew he excused himself and with a message to the wounded man turned his back upon him the courtier had not yet learned what view the queen would take of this unfortunate affair and besides he was overloaded with business the new enterprise required the issue of a large number of documents conferring authority which all passed through his hands cleopatra addressed a few kind encouraging words to each one of the experts who had been entrusted with the execution of her plan gorgias too was permitted to kiss her robe which stirred his blood afresh he would fain have flung himself at the feet of this marvellous woman and with his services place his life at her disposal and cleopatra noticed the enthusiastic ardour of his glance he too had been mentioned in the list of barine's admirers there must be something unusual about this woman but could she have fired a body of grave men in behalf of a great almost impossible deed rouse them to such enthusiastic admiration as she the vanquished menaced queen certainly not she felt in the right mood to confront barine as judge and rival in the midst of the deepest misery she had spent one happy hour she had again felt with joyous pride that her intellect fresh and unclouded would be capable of outstripping the best powers and in truth she needed no magic goblet to win hearts End of chapter eleven